Well, it's always nice to be with this class. And you've heard me say this before, but I say it again. When I was serving as pastor, I loved rainy days like this. <laughs> because people could not go play golf and they could not go fishing so they'd come to church. <laughs> and soccer games are canceled. And soccer games are canceled. That's right. That's right. Well, let's pray. Be with us as we study your word. May it feed our minds and hearts and may it motivate us to continue the work of Christ on earth. Amen. Our lesson comes from the second chapter of Genesis, verses 18 to 24. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human said, This one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called a woman because from a man she was taken. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife and they become one flesh. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they were not embarrassed. The man Adam knew his wife Eve intimately. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain and said, I have given life to a man with the Lord's help. She gave birth a second time to Cain's brother Abel. Abel cared for the flocks and Cain farmed the fertile land. This uh, scripture lesson has many themes in it. A lot of the lessons that we study have one theme that carries through the lesson. But in this particular scripture lesson, there are several lessons to be learned. In this scripture lesson and in creation, God takes the initiative. When you read the creation stories in the first two chapters of Genesis, you see that God is the kind of God that takes the initiative to create, to make, to create relationships. And you also see that in God's Son, Jesus. Jesus was one who took the initiative with people. Again and again in the Gospels, people both come to Jesus, but Jesus also takes the initiative to go to people. How many times do you see Jesus reaching out to people who are lonely, to people who are sick, to people who are troubled? Likewise, if we follow in the example of Jesus, the church, the body of Christ, should be a body of Christ that takes the initiative to reach out to people. We not only wait for people to come to us, but we take the initiative to reach out to people. So in the first creation story, we see God creating out of his own initiative and out of his own love. Then the Lord God said, 
It is not good that the human is alone. God intends for us to live in relationships, in relationships with each other, with family, with friends. For you see, Christianity itself is a communal religion. It's not just about individual faith, though that is there, but it is a communal religion. We experience grace in community. We often experience Christ in community. To be sure, we experience Christ when we're doing our private devotions and prayer and meditation. But it's also in community like this that we experience God's grace. One of the reasons, though not the only one, but one of the reasons that Christianity is growing so fast in China is because the Chinese people are a communal people. And this communal faith fits into their communal way of life. And so God said, it's not good that humans, that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. Which is a way of saying that God intends for us to be helpful to each other. We're not to disregard each other, but we are to be helpful to each other. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all of the wild animals, all the birds of the sky, and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. Again, we see God taking the initiative to create wildlife, wild animals, birds of the sky. But then he brings those to man and asks man to name them. In other words, God gave to humankind a responsibility, a responsibility to do the naming. So God is the kind of God who takes initiative, but God is the kind of God who gives us responsibility. We have a responsibility to name and to be present in relationship with each other. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all of the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So here, man is naming, but still needs a helper. For God does not intend for people to be alone. It reminds me of how much God must love diversity different animals, different birds, different plants. God must be a lover of diversity. Wayne Fleck and I have a garden plot at the Heritage and uh, people who have garden plots really enjoy seeing each other in the garden and talking garden talk. <laughs> now, Wayne has the prettiest tomato plants in all the garden. And he's probably had more tomatoes off of his plant than any of the rest of us. But there's diversity in the garden. No tomato plant is the same. In fact, one of the things we like to talk about is the many different varieties of tomatoes that we see in that one place. And if you go further than that, no tomato, no one tomato is like any other tomato. They're different in size, they're different in feelings, they're different in taste. Because this God who creates 
is a God who loves diversity. Then you look at all of us in here this morning. None of us are carbon copies of each other. Because God, <laughs> Rich just said, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, we're glad we're not like you, Rick. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, but still something was lacking. God created. God took initiative. Diversity was there. The animals and plants and birds were named. But still something was missing. So since something was missing, so the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. It's interesting, isn't it? How the woman was formed from the flesh I mean, from the rib of a man. One scholar has said that probably one of the reasons that the woman was formed from the rib is because the rib is close to the heart. Didn't form woman from the neck or the foot but from the rib because the rib is close to the heart which might mean that God intends us to live in a heart to heart relationship with each other so that no one would feel alone and then the scripture says <laughs> This, this one finally is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because from a man she was taken. We were working with this text one time and somehow the question was asked to the class, what's your favorite Bible verse? an old codger in the class spoke up and said, well, when Paul said that a wife should be subject to his husband, that's my, that's my, to her husband, that's my favorite verse. <laughs> well, that's not what is intended here. Rather, the message that you get here is that man and woman are bone and bone and flesh and flesh of each other. Then this is an interesting part of the text. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife, and they become one flesh. In the rest of the Bible, it's the woman who leaves father and mother to be with the man. But in this early chapter of Genesis, it's the man who leaves to be joined to the woman. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they were not embarrassed. They were in their natural state. They had not yet disobeyed God by eating of the tree of the fruit of good and evil. Or you remember the story how God put them in the garden and ask them not to eat the fruit from the tree. But they did. And after they ate the fruit from the tree, then they covered themselves because they were ashamed of what they had done. And then in Genesis 4, 1, 2, the man Adam knew his wife intimately she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain and said, I have given life to a man with the Lord's help. She gave birth a second time to Cain's brother Abel. 
Abel cared for the flocks, and Cain farmed the fertile land. So Cain and Abel are put to work. They have work to do, to farm and to care for the livestock, which is, I think, the scripture's way of saying that work is important, that we are created to work. I have observed that some of the most fulfilled people are the people who know where they are gifted and who build their lives around their gifts. And some of the most fulfilled people in work are the people who understand how to use the gifts God has given them in the work that they do. Isn't it wonderful to be a person or to know a person who has never worked in his or her life because the work they did was such a joy and such a pleasure. It's wonderful when we feel God's calling in our work and that we find meaning and joy in it. As Janine will tell you, I have in many ways never worked a day in my life because I have felt called to what I do and I've loved it. And I love the people where I have been appointed, appointed to serve and do the work that God has called me to do. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Says I was using past tense, and it is still true. That's right. Well, the, the, the point here is that after Cain and Abel were created, they didn't just sit around, but they went to work. And God creates us for relationships, but also there is a work for each of us to do. Now as Christians, we do our work in a certain way. We do our work as baptized people. Our first identity is that we are baptized people. When we understand ourselves as baptized people, we go about our work in a different way. Here is a school teacher who understands herself as a baptized person who happens to be a school teacher. And she teaches school in a different way. Here is a physician who knows that his first identification is that he's a baptized person who happens to be a doctor. And he goes about his work a different way. I know of an attorney in Virginia that took his baptismal certificate and had it enlarged and put in a frame. And he has that baptismal certificate hanging up in his office. He said, why do you do that? He said, because I want every one of my clients to know that they've come to see a baptized person who happens to be a lawyer. So we've, as with Cain and Abel, we've been, been given work to do. And may our work glorify God. So the key verses for this lesson are to celebrate the fact that we've been created to live in a relationship with God and other human beings. And this is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife and they become one flesh. 
Have you ever known anybody who's alone? Have you? Could some of you share an experience you might have had with a person who's alone? You don't use names, but what would it like to what would it be like to feel alone in life? Feel like no support group, no place. No support group, no place. Right. It's a sense of nobody caring whether they come or go or where they are, what they're feeling. It's a, it's a sense of no one caring, no sounding board. No one cares if they come and go. It's being in the wilderness, right? And some people hibernate. And they also fixate. And they also fixate. That's right. May I suggest as a conclusion to this lesson that if we know someone who is alone, and I think most all of us do. Could we make a commitment today to reach out to them sometime this week? With a telephone call, with a visit, with a note. For according to this text, God did not create us to be alone, but to be in relationship with other people. Thanks be to God.